Tonight's guest, uh, Baroness Cox, has... You're not going to get much of her if you clap every time I mention her name. She has founded and leads a small and effective trust, HEART, the Humanitarian Aid Relief Trust. And this work takes her to some of the most troubled and downright dangerous spots in the world. We're talking Sudan, southern Sudan, Burma, and most recently, northern Nigeria. And the Lord has laid it upon her heart to have a real concern for the marginalized and the dispossessed, whoever they are, but especially for the persecuted church. And often that causes Caroline to put her, her life in danger. Not so many years, the government of Azerbaijan put a bounty on her head, but it doesn't seem to stop her. So tonight we're going to eavesdrop just a little bit on her world. We'll find out what makes her tick. And more importantly, we'll consider how we can be better informed and come alongside and get involved. So let's give a really heartfelt UCCF welcome to the Baroness Cox of Queensbury. <laughs> Lovely to meet you. you. Have a seat. It's so much fun having you at Forum. They're a lively crew. They certainly are. It's not often Christians come into a meeting Gangnam style, but this, this, <laughs> this lot do. Now, Caroline, you are most well known as an active figure in, in the House of Lords, campaigning for the marginalised and the dispossessed. But just tell us how you came to be ennobled and what you were doing at the time. Well, thank you, Richard. Thank you for having me here with you tonight. It's wonderful. I'm inspired by you all already. When I'm asked to introduce myself, all I ever say is I'm a nurse and a social scientist by intention. That's what I thought I was doing with my life. But God has a great sense of humor. I'm a baroness by astonishment. Uh, you know, and I really was not in that world. In fact, I was so much not in that world, I was actually the first baroness I'd ever met. I never <laughs> met one before. <laughs> You know, didn't move in that world. You wake up one morning and find a baroness looking at yourself out of the bathroom mirror. Quite a shock. But you say to God, wow, thank you. What a privilege to be able to speak in the House of Lords, which of course being a baroness enables you to do. How can I use that privilege, God? Mm. And I think the words came very clearly. It's a wonderful arena in which to be a voice for those who have no voice. And that's what I've tried to do uh, since that extraordinary bit of divine amusing intervention, challenging intervention yeah. in my life. Okay, Karen, let's just go back to that moment of astonishment uh, and what you were doing as a social scientist, because you caught the eye of the serving Prime Minister of the day, Margaret Thatcher. Just tell us a little bit about that story. It's quite fascinating and an important insight into what makes you tick. Yeah, well, going back, I know, quite a few years when I was lecturing at um, one of a grey college in a grey part of North London. It's now a university. I won't mention its name. But it was North really... North London Poly. As it was then. <laughs> it's got another name now. <laughs> but it was a real challenge because I mentioned that I was in social science and I found myself head of a department of social sciences. Out of an academic staff of 20, 16 were Communist Party or further left. And I really mean hard-line Marxist-Leninism. Now, their version of higher education is not mine. Mine, and I'm sure yours, is the freedom to pursue the truth wherever that pursuit will take you. Theirs was hard-line ideological indoctrination, ruthless, brutal, character assassination, physical assault, academic blackmail, students who come to me in tears, what happens if I don't write the ideologically correct essay, they'll fail my exams. Just one little story, it was violent. We had regular occupations and they were violent. You had very aggressive picket lines. You had to force your way through those picket lines. I had some wonderful students. Uh, they did not want occupations. They wanted to study. They would paid to study. They were dedicated students. And remember, one occupation was based on lies. A new director was to be appointed. And they used all the old slogans, racist, fascist, racist, fascist. I knew Terence Miller was neither. He had fought in World War II at the Battle of Arnhem. He'd seen most of his friends killed fighting fascism. 
As far as racism is concerned, he'd worked in what was then northern Rhodesia, nearly kicked out for helping black students. So this occupation was premised on lies. So I'm not going to join it. So I arrived and got back to the picket lines, had a lovely group of students who were desperate for class in criminology. I was happy to teach, but there were bands of vigilantes who'd come round and break up the class who didn't teach, which was authorised by the Occupation Collective Committee. Well, they were desperate for a class, seminar. We sat in the room, I put myself across the door, because there were bands of vigilantes who'd come round and break you up if you weren't teaching what was authorised. Got halfway through the hour, then a band of vigilantes came, banged on the door, opened it a quarter of an inch. They shouted through, what's going on in here? I said, this is a BSc Sociology Criminology seminar. It's what the students are paid to study, I'm paid to teach it, and I'm going to. And if you want to stop me, you're going to have to knock me off my chair. If you do, I will see you're personally liable for any injury I sustain. Bang the door shut as loud as I could from a quarter of an inch, gesture of defiance. They, sh <laughs> they shouted through the door, right here, we'll be back, dearie. Well, I tried to concentrate the next half hour. We had a moral victory, but at that hour, they came back, they broke up uh, the class, I was knocked off the chair, and it was a pretty violent situation. It has a happy ending, though. The beginning of the next academic year, the student who led the assault came to see me, looking a little bit sheepish, and said, Caroline, would you mind being my academic tutor this year? I said, Tony, I love living dangerously. Of course, I would love it. <laughs> But just final point, is it just is a little insight into the intimidation and the indoctrination and the ideology of those days. I got to know Tony very well. He was a slightly older student. He'd worked below decks on <clears throat> Merchant Navy oil tankers, not a soft life. And one day he said to me, Caroline, you know it takes a, something, a lot of courage to ask to have you as a tutor. I'm not boasting now, but it's an indication of intimidation. He said most of the final year students would like to ask to have you as a tutor. They daren't, because the other staff will fail their exams. That was Britain. Okay, before you were born, 1970s, but for me, it highlighted the enormous importance of freedom, of academic freedom, and one of the very first um, amendments I moved in the House of Lords was to protect academic freedom in our universities. So precious, never take it mm. for granted. Okay, Caroline, that's, that's fascinating. We're going to fast forward now to the present day, and we're not going to talk about Syria or northern Iraq, because I know it's a founding principle of heart to work for the marginalized, the oppressed, the dispossessed, where there isn't alternative uh, relief coming to the from the major organizations, and where they just seem to be off the radar of the world's media. And so we're going to talk, first of all, about Sudan sure. and South Sudan. I know you visit South Sudan often, um, and occasionally and illegally you go to mm -hmm. Sudan uh, and the Khartoum government have in the past uh, served a prison sentence on you. So just tell us what's going on there in Sudan and South mm. Sudan. Thank you for having a convict in your midst. You're very <laughs> inclusive. I wanted so. to know what, what, what the total of the bounty was on your head, what you're worth. Well, it was in rubles, not dollars, so I can't tell you how really valuable okay. I am. But very, very briefly to come back to the harsh realities of Sudan today. Sudan is ruled by a president who has been indicted by the International Criminal Court for war crimes, crimes against humanity in Darfur. He has declared his intention to turn his Republic of Sudan into a unified Arabic Islamic nation. So he's carrying out genocide of the Africans and the non-Muslims, especially in two of the southern states, in the Nuba Mountains and in Blue Nile. There's constant aerial bombardment. Um, there is, I've been there, we crossed the border illegally, as you said, to get the evidence to be with the people. And that constant aerial bombardment means a half a million people have fled, are hiding in mountains, in caves, with deadly snakes, and maybe we'll have a picture just to highlight that. And I was there with them. There are deadly snakes in those caves. They say we're more afraid of the bombs than of the snakes. Others are having to hide in forests. And the situation there is one of thousands and thousands of people dying of hunger. Um, also, in the war, um, in moving quickly from Sudan to South Sudan on the southern border, that suffered a horrendous war in which two million perished, four million were displaced. And we've been there many, many times. But just come with me into Sudan again, into one of the areas, we can um, see the next picture, please. Um, this is Yabus. It's a market, it's been deliberately firebombed. I just take a picture of myself there to show I really was there. And another picture just shows a very poignant 
very poignant scene. This is a village in Blue Nile. Blue Nile, 80% Muslim, 20% Christian, we're there for them all, Christian village. But this village, 450 people had died of starvation. But when we got there, our host held up this cross and said, with this cross, they would have celebrated Christmas. And they would, they still worship with joy, even in suffering. But it was empty, because it had recently been targeted with missiles. But we heard the sound of voices in the bush, and we followed the sound of those voices, and we found people who'd fled from that village, but survived the hunger. They were living in complete destitution, as you will see in the next slide. They have nothing. But I'm very happy to say that the Isle of Man Overseas Aid Committee had given Hart 25,000 pounds. Our wonderful partners had got that food through to these people, living in destitution, but they said, thank God, we have food. We no longer have to flee into South Sudan to survive because we have no food. If we are died because we are killed by bombs, we prefer to die in our own country than have to flee into exile. Thank you to Hart. Well, we thank God we can be with people in that ultimately devastated situation, but be alongside them and fulfilling the biblical mandate of feed the hungry. Moving very quickly from Sudan uh, to South Sudan, uh, that is a country, as I say, which has suffered horrendously, uh, two million killed, four million displaced in the previous war. One of the worst things, hundreds of thousands of women and children were abducted into slavery. We were able to rescue many hundreds of them. If any of you here have an interest in contemporary slavery and human trafficking, and I hope you all do, uh, because it is a barbaric phenomenon and growing in our world today, some of the stories of the people whom we rescued from slavery in South Sudan are in here, and they are heartbreaking stories. Can you give us the title, Caroline. Indeed, it's called This Immoral Trade, Slavery in the 21st Century. It'll be available, I'm happy to talk to you about it after the talk if you like, but please do engage with the contemporary issues of slavery in other countries and of trafficking in our own country. But we have a wonderful partner in South Sudan, Bishop Moses. He is a hero of the peace. His devastated land, everything wiped out, and now got thousands of people fleeing from Sudan itself. They're living in desolation. But he goes round, he preaches a message of reconciliation, and he is a phenomenon in terms of spreading the gospel. When we were there, wait for it, he had just confirmed, that is people who've come forward to reaffirm their faith, 3,000 people from three villages. Mm. How much we'd like to do that in our own churches in this country, but how the church grows under persecution. Yeah. But please do pray for them. Caroline, um, going from Sudan, South Sudan, now to Nigeria, for, for many years, perhaps decades, uh, particularly in the north, Christians have experienced shocking persecution. And with Boko Haram and the abduction of girls, um, lots has been on our screens in recent weeks. Just tell us about the situation there. Okay, just come travel with me for a few moments and witness some of the situations we have seen and you can take them in your hearts and in your thoughts and prayers. Um, over the last 20 years, thousands of Christians have been killed, hundreds of churches destroyed. This is an evangelical church in Jos in Plateau State, attacked by a suicide bomber in the middle of a service. Um, another picture shows you the university church in Dross. Just imagine if that was your university church. Pretty stark, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And another picture shows the wonderful Anglican bishop of Bouchy State in one of his churches. So many hundreds of churches destroyed. But another picture tells a different story. Read that. In the middle of the ruins, mm -hmm. to God be the glory. One of the wonderful things about being with a persecuted church is that if your church is destroyed or damaged, and even some of your church members killed, people will be back within hours worshiping in the ruins. And another book which I felt impelled to write, my colleague Ben Rogers, was actually born in India, when we'd been when a lot of churches had been burnt and Christians killed in India. And I was walking through the ruins, and I was walking over the rubble and the burnt cross and the crushed and shattered Bibles, and the phrase came to me, the very stones will cry out. And then I thought, oh, Cox, another book has just been born. You've got to write it. But the marvelous message is, yes, the churches are destroyed, we've just seen, in their hundreds and in many, many countries. But the stones do cry out, but they cry out with worship. The churches are destroyed, but the church lives. 
The church grows under persecution. Think of Bishop Moses confirming 3,000 people from three villages. And the church loves. We never get a message of hatred or revenge. So if you want a bit of inspiration for the persecuted church, the very stones cry out to their worship. Mm. But in Nigeria recently, of course, Boko Haram has hit the headlines. We were in Boko Haram territory against all official advice just a few weeks ago. And I must say, it is horrendous. Please, please pray. In January, just in Bauchi State, we saw the bishop. 5,000 people are being killed in Jan since January this year. 173 teachers killed, many in schools. Perhaps one of the worst things, you probably remember the story of those girls kidnapped from Chibok, 270. We heard about them. But this year, before they were kidnapped, 1,800 are being kidnapped, we never heard about, and hundreds since then. And almost every day, Christian villages are being attacked. Mm. As we hear that, I mean, that just sounds just awful. I mean, what possible realistic hope is there for the future? in Nigeria? Well, the bigger political scene is very bleak, but the churches are doing wonderful work at healing, at reconciliation, at, at work bringing communities together to build friendship, confidence building, and to restore um, some of the mutual trust and friendship that had been there between the Christians and the Muslims. This is Dross in Plateau State, and one of the churches there has a wonderful outreach program uh, to Muslim women and also to Muslim boys and girls. But here I am with some of those Christian and Muslim women, and they, it, I wish you could be there. Uh, it is so full of hope. The women learn together how to make various things which will enable them to earn a living, have economic independence, pride, dignity. They do bead making, they do tailoring, but above all, it's an arena where hurts can be healed and Christian love can be expressed. And the next picture just shows, look at that lovely face. This Muslim lady, she is so thrilled to be loved, to be affirmed. And also she's been given economic skills. She would have some economic independence, which she probably would not have got within her own community. So there is real hope from Christian love and reconciliation in Nigeria. But the threats are real. Please pray. One of our partners is a wonderful Anglican bishop, a bishop, uh, oh, he's archbishop, sorry, bishop, he's archbishop <laughs> Ben Koshi, his lovely wife, Gloria. Now, he has a Christian institute, trains men and women in ministry, in music, oh, you'd love their music and they'd love yours, and IT, fantastic ministry in Dross. But also, when we were there in Dross, he gave us rather a challenging warning. He said, if we have a faith worth living for, it's a faith worth dying for, and they are, as we've seen. Don't you, that's us, compromise the faith we are living and dying for. My friends, we are compromising that faith in this country. For example, we have allowed over 80 Sharia courts with Sharia law to be established in the United Kingdom. You may be aware that Sharia law inherently enshrines gender discrimination in so many ways that many Muslim women are really suffering in Britain today in ways that would make our suffragettes turn in their grave. Also, the existence of a parallel quasi-legal system is, of course, a threat to that fundamental principle of one law for all. I work a lot with the Muslim women. One Muslim woman in tears said to me, I feel betrayed by Britain. I came here to get away from all this Sharia, and it is worse here than it was in my country of origin. This is Britain today. Archbishop Ben also gave us another challenge. He said, if you, that's us, do not fight these battles now, your grandchildren are going to have to fight the battles you have not had the courage to fight. I don't want my grandchildren to have to fight the battles I've not had the courage to fight. So one initiative which I have uh, put in place is a private member's bill trying to deal with this issue of, we just have to practice this before I say it, it's a tongue twister, religiously sanctioned gender discrimination. But the women are really suffering, and also that threat to one law for all. Mm. So I would really be grateful, please, if you might come alongside me on that. Happy to send details of our email. Pray for that bill, pray for the women, pray for our freedom but also write to your MPs. 
There are practical things you can do in the political arena because we must begin to draw a line in the sand. As I draw to a conclusion, I'd just like, I think, to leave with you key, my, perhaps my um, clarion call for tonight would be two words with a double entendre. Look out. First of all, look out on the home front and look at what we can do to defend our precious freedoms. We're so fortunate. We've inherited so much. Freedom, which is priceless. Many people have died to give us our freedom. And relative plenty. We must draw lines in the sand to protect those fundamental freedoms. And we must be prepared to speak out and challenge fearlessly anything which is a threat to those fundamental freedoms. It means we have to do our homework. We have to be able to argue and debate effectively, having done our homework. And of course, we must spread enthusiastically, as you do, the good news of the gospel. So much to do in this country. And also look out to that wider world. Please, please, please get alongside our brothers and sisters holding those front lines of faith and freedom. Get alongside them spiritually, if not personally and practically. St. Paul, in his letter to the church of Corinth, said, if one part of the body of Christ suffers, we all suffer. We're not necessarily called, say, to get alongside them physically, but their priority request, whenever we're with them, is always for prayer. We can all pray. But we also know that prayer without deeds is dead, as love without action is dead. Therefore, we have to be available, available to God. I always much like that cliche. I think it's a very profound cliche. God doesn't need our ability he wants our availability. And it's only if we make ourselves available to God in prayer that he can use us for his purposes. Every single one of you here has been blessed by God with amazing gifts, great gifts of ability. Each one of you is using those gifts well. You're studying at university, you're obviously very good leaders, and you're obviously are using his gift of Christian commitment, and I really salute that. But please now do ask God how we should look out, look out to challenges in our own country, how we can spread the gospel, hold the front lines of faith and freedom in our own country, and look out away from our country to the broader horizons around the world, and ask God how he wants to use you and ask God for that willingness to go wherever he wants to send you to serve in his kingdom. Now, he may not call you to do crazy things like I do. My life is a crazy roller coaster. But he may not call you to the remote places on those front lines of faith and freedom where heart is working. But please be prepared to respond to his calling. As in the words, and I love this verse of the hymn, I won't sing it, I'm the world's worst singer, but I think these words, maybe we can just say them to ourselves and listen and see how we respond to this challenge. Our Lord saying to us, will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you? and you in me. Well, sometimes when we look at the challenges around us, we can feel overwhelmed. We don't know where to begin. The challenges are so legion here in our own beloved country, in other countries, and you've heard some wonderful testimonies challenging facing students in other countries, and I do thank God for their witness and their challenge. But sometimes needs are so legion. We don't know where to begin. We can be almost so overwhelmed, almost paralyzed. Maybe we just don't begin at all. But my little organization, Heart, working, as Richard said, in many, many different countries, there's only four and a half of us in Heart. We work through wonderful local partners. But we can sometimes feel overwhelmed by the enormity of needs in Sudan, South Sudan, Nigeria, Burma, India, many countries. But we have a little motto. And when we feel overwhelmed, we just remember these words of our little motto. Okay, I cannot do everything, but I must not do nothing. And if together we all do something, 
we really can have a little bit of the privilege of sharing the pain and the passion of our brothers and sisters and the privilege of making a difference for God in his kingdom, in this world, and for you in your universities and what ama whatever amazing things God may have for each one of you in your lives. Already blessed so much, I know each one of you will be a huge blessing as you go through your lives. But thank you for letting me share a little bit of the pain and the passion of my life with you tonight. Caroline, um, you've been a model for timing. Uh, so if you don't mind me just being a bit more personal, just for our closing mm -hmm. minutes, do you mind me asking you how old you are? Sure, 77. Mm. Yes, uh. <laughs> right. Thank you, everyone. I, I, I don't I, mind you asking, Richard. I mean, it's a gift from God, isn't it? Yeah. It's crazy. Now, I, wasn't, I wasn't being deliberate in person. I just think <laughs> so often we can feel disqualified from doing the next thing that's in front of us because, oh, I don't, well, a bit like Moses, or really, you know, I don't have the speaking gift or I don't have the temperament, I, I don't have the background, I don't have the courage. And, you know, when you do get to the age of 77, you can say, okay, Lord, you know, it's the next generation now. I've got grandchildren, I've got Children? a family, Ten. I've got responsibility. Ten grandchildren. <laughs> um, how, how would you respond to people here who are thinking, well, this is a very remarkable person, she, her gifts have been recognized, she's been put in, in, in the House of Lords, but you're actually saying, well, you know, I'm, you know, I'm feeling my, my humanity, I'm getting into dangerous situations. How would you, what would you say to those who, who are feeling, well, you know, I just really don't feel up to the needs, to responding to them? Well, thank you for the question. Um, I never felt up to any of the responsibilities that came my way. I'm actually basically pathologically shy. And I can just give you a little insight into that. You know, about 100 years ago, when I was still a teenager, <laughs> I was so shy. If I went to a party, I never said a word all evening. But also, at school, for some strange reason, they made me head of school. I don't know why. It stopped me playing practical jokes, I think. But anyway, <laughs> um, it brought with it the terrifying responsibility for a shy person to be the president of the debating society. Well, when you're nervous, some of you may be shy. You know, it takes a long time to wind up your courage to speak. And I was so shy, that by the time I wound up my courage to speak, it was always too late. I was the silent president of the debating society, never said a word. <laughs> and it is quite a challenge, not much of a confidence booster, when you're appointed to the House of Lords, the mm. premier debating society in the country, uh, as my track record as a president of a debating society. But I'm still <laughs> shy. And I think what you have to do is, if God opens a door in front of you, and it's not something that you contrived, manipulated, it wasn't your ambition. If a door opens in front of you, I think one needs to go through that door, because you've no idea what God has in place for you on the other side of that door. And if you don't go through that door, you will never find out. And however inadequate you feel, remember, God doesn't need our ability. My speaking ability was horrendous our availability, he'll give us the ability we need mm. to do what he wants us to be available for. And I think as far as my great age is concerned, people sometimes say with your great age, you know, how do you got the energy? Well, the answer to that is, it is the pain of seeing the suffering, whether it's the Muslim women in this country, or whether it's the people we work with, the persecuted church around the world, or other people suffering that agony of persecution. The pain gives you the passion, and the passion gives you the energy. Mm. I'm sure you had no idea when you were making that stand at the North London Poly, when you weren't so much going through a door of opportunity, but preventing the bullies from coming through your door to interrupt your lectures, where the Lord would place you. Mm. And that is just a really helpful mm. final word for us. Caroline, it really has been an absolute pleasure. Now, I know you're going to be around in the book stall area of the exhibition tent when the meeting's finished. Uh, Caroline's literature will be laid out. Do go and chat to her, take the literature, purchase some of the books. Caroline said she'll gladly sign them and talk With to you about discount, them. The With a discount, Yes, yeah, <laughs> discount if they're signed. No, it makes it far more valuable. <laughs> But, Caroline, as I say, it's been a, a pleasure and a privilege. We are so grateful to the Lord for you. Let's thank her. Thank you.